Well, Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord, and the Lord told him that the people were not going to listen. After hearing a text like that, I just feel like I need to pray. So would you pray one more time with me this morning? Lord, we ask that we will turn and that we will be healed. We ask that like Isaiah, we will behold the glory of the king in new and in bigger ways each and every day in our lives here on earth. Lord, we confess that we do not think of you or see you as we are. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be ever-present with us here this morning. Help us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, it's, um, I'm going to move this because I feel like I'm already clipping in the mic for you. It's been a hot minute, it feels like, since I've been up here between the holidays and, and the unveiled youth retreat where we, uh, we considered the book of Ecclesiastes, which um, for most humans is pretty much a, a big Debbie Downer thing. The things that you think matter don't actually matter. And um, during that reality check with the students, we, um, we began to realize or at least begin to see a picture of the things in life that actually matter. Right? One, of, uh, one of the students texted me that week and said, um, you know what, this is great. I just don't care what others think of me anymore. You see, so much in life is about an eclipse. There's a lot of talk about an eclipse nowadays, isn't there? We're talking about an eclipse of that which is more important, eclipsing that which is of lesser importance. And so at the Unveiled Retreat, we decided to do something a little out of the ordinary. It was late at night, it was dark out, and we're all going about doing our own things. In, in a sense, just we're in this general area, and some kids are talking here, and some kids are doing that, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, with unannounced three Christmas trees show up. I've showed this picture before. And this is what happened after a matter of a few moments. For reference, you'll see about a six-foot kid in the bottom right corner. <laughs> it didn't matter what anyone was doing off here on their corner. It didn't take long for them to hear the whoosh and then to feel the heat and be like, whoa, there's a 20-foot fire over there. You see, so much of life is about these eclipses. Is it not? And um, how many here have made plans for the upcoming eclipse? Now, all right, real confession time. I, I, I saw this, um, this article that said people have actually mapped out plane flight paths so they can be in the air so that what, if it's cloudy, they won't miss it. And I'm just, did anyone uh, get a plane ticket so that they can watch the eclipse from up high? I will point you out when you raise your hand, so, so don't. <laughs> but the eclipse come in the same day as the congregational meeting on March 8th, and I'm probably going to forget about it and, and miss out. Um, whenever the, the, in this case, the moon is coming between the earth and the sun, Mike Miller was telling me right before church, he said, 400. The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon. And it's exactly... 400 times further than the moon, which is why an eclipse works the way it does. That's why they look like they are the same size. Well, today, Palm Sunday is a day about kingship, when the glory of a king, and our prayer this morning is that the glory of the king will eclipse all else in life. So we'll be taking a break from the Gospel of Luke as we focus in on Palm Sunday the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and was heralded as a king. So I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 12. I do invite you to open up, if you don't have a Bible, to open up the one in front of you, because we got a whole bunch of text to cover this morning, and it's on page 845. Now we do have 
quite a chunk of, of scripture to read this morning, and we're going to pause a few times throughout, make some general observations as we go, and then at the end, we'll, we'll kind of come back. We honestly, I, although I wish we could teach deeply through everything, we just don't have the time, so don't get too antsy, okay? Some of you get antsy. Don't get antsy. Um, as you turn, we're going to see a few different groups of people in today's account. So 12, 12, it starts with just these first few words. It says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast. So what on earth are we talking about? We have a feast and we have a crowd. Well, Quickly, we're talking about the Passover feast, where at this point in Israel's history, it was obligatory, it was nearly mandatory for the Jews to celebrate this particular feast in the city of Jerusalem. It's kind of like, I, I don't even know modern day equivalent. Christmas, you all, everyone in the world has to go to, Muslims have to go to Mecca, right? It's like that. But they all have to come to Jerusalem at one point in time. They're coming for the Passover when the blood of a lamb saved Jewish lives from dying. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 12. But we see the word large crowd. I don't know if you're like me, like, how large are we talking? If all of the, the Jews, all of those who hold to the Jewish religion are coming to the city of Jerusalem, while we can't know for certainty, a lot of people have surmised in the high two million people. So we got millions of people. So if we just assume two million people are going to this city, it's, um, it's like this, reference. Washington County, you know what the, um, the, the math is really easy. You know what the population of Washington County is? 200,000 flat. So we got 10 times that population coming to one city. Um, and it gets a little bit more extreme because Washington County, yeah, you got Burgettstown and then you got Bentleyville, right? We have opposite corners. Well, the size of Jerusalem, I mapped it for you up here on, on the screen. You see that green? At biggest, it's 640 acres, which if you're hunting it, you're like, that's a lot of acreage. But if you're trying to cram 2 million people in it, it's not. That blue star is Walmart. That red star is Target, Giant Eagle, Kohl's. Yeah, you try and cram two million people in that. Um, I did a little bit more. It's almost like trying to put the entire population of Washington County at Trinity Point. And you complain now of like the traffic that's going by in Trinity Point at 3 p.m. <laughs> We're talking about cramming people in more than just inside this little room here. So whenever it says the word large crowd, I mean, I'd be trying to get out of that city. I don't know about you. I'm leaving at any chance I got. It is a big crowd. And so with that in the back of our minds, let's just continue to read. So the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So we see as Jesus 
is coming to the city. The crowd comes together and they're screaming out. They're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They're calling him king, and this is a really big crowd. But did you catch some of those four different groups of people? The first was in verse 16. We see his disciples. Verse 17 tells us about a crowd that had been with him. So Jesus was staying a couple miles out of the city of Jerusalem in a town called Bethany. And that he literally brought a dude back to life. He brought Lazarus back to life. And so everyone who is, saw him do that in Bethany starts following, like, oh, this is a good dude to follow. He can keep me alive. So they start following him to Jerusalem. In verse 18, so we have the crowd coming with Jesus to Jerusalem. Verse 18 tells us we have a crowd coming from Jerusalem to meet him. So you see the two different crowds. They're coming from two different places. And the verse 18 crowd is coming to meet him. Why? Because they had heard. One crowd saw what he did. One had heard. And then verse 19, you have the, the Pharisees, the stuffy, too good for everyone else, people in power. And their response isn't quite so uplifting. I remember as our study through the book of Luke, for weeks and for months, we've seen them trying to stop everything that Jesus is doing. And now they're saying, he's got so much momentum, he's got too many followers. He's ruining it for us. And so they start to, as they're like, they're, and they're really bitter, they just start to bicker amongst each other. So, I thought you were supposed to do something about this, didn't you? I thought you were supposed to do something about it, didn't you? You're gaining nothing. And so with these four groups in our mind, let's continue to read verse 20. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who is from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So we see that the crowd is not just a whole bunch of ethnic Jews, but we see that there are some Greeks, some Gentiles in Jerusalem too, right? They're not ethnically Jews, but they are religiously Jews, and that's why they're here. And to them... Jesus begins to detail what a real follower will look like. He says, unless a grain of wheat falls and dies. How many green thumb people do we have? Have you planted your bulbs yet after this cold snap? I guess today's pretty much the first day. But, it, but it's like this. You got this ranch sunflower seed that Zeb loves to eat. And unless a seed, is there life in this seed? No. But unless it goes into the dirt, unless it goes into the ground, that's what Jesus is saying, unless it's selfless and it dies and it goes into the ground, but only then, the only fruit it's going to bear now is taste like ranch and get to spit the rest out. But once it goes into the ground and it blooms, that's what Jesus is saying. What's he starting to have in view here? He's starting to point towards something that he's about to do on Friday, unless a grain of seed falls into the earth and dies. And so it is with Jesus. That's what he's about to do, is it not? See, if anyone serves Jesus, he must follow Jesus, even to the point of humiliation, as he is about to do. And verse 27 says, Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, the hour of his death. He's going to die this week. But for this purpose, Jesus says, 
I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. See, as Jesus moves closer and closer and closer to that hour, the hour, the whole purpose for which he came to die, everything that's just kind of secondary, all of just the, the gravy, no, that's not the focus. Now he has a sole purpose, and everything else begins to fade in significance. And in this beautiful moment, perhaps one of the most special moments when the, the thin veneer between heaven and earth is, is bridge, and God the Father verbally speaks out so everyone around can hear. He says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Whenever that thin curtain is finally bridged, you know what's beautiful? The crowd heard it. They heard it. They knew something special had just happened. They'd seen Jesus bring Lazarus back from the dead. They knew this is not normal. But they didn't get it, did they? Some of them thought it had thundered. Others, oh, an angel has spoken to him over there. But Jesus' response, verse 30, Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake and not mine. They missed the whole point. And Jesus goes on, 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard that the, from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can he say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. What we just read, it gets even, the story gets even juicier in a sense. Jesus is starting to use what we would say is more cryptic language. When I'm lifted up from the earth, what in the world is he talking about? You know, levitating, jetpacks, you name it. No, verse 33 tells us, he says, it, it says, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Which for us nowadays is like, to be lifted up is not to die. But just like the bronze serpent, as some of you will remember, was raised up on a pole for the people of Israel to look upon and be saved, Jesus too will be lifted up. Or put another way, when someone was hung on a cross, how many builders or carpenters do we have? It's a lot harder to nail like this, a lot easier to nail down. He laid on the cross as he's lying down, and they would lift up the cross and set it in place. And so as Jesus would be lifted up, it was abundantly clear, was it not? At least to the people there. You see, the people got it. There was no cryptic language because what was their response? They said, we've heard that this son of man lives forever. How on earth are you going to say he's going to be lifted up? How on earth are you saying he's going to die? 
It was abundantly clear to them. And still, they're not getting it. Who is this son of man? Now, son of man is just another title for Jesus, if you will. And that's the question of the crowd here. It's also the same question in Matthew's account of the triumphal entry from the crowd in verse 21. Who is this? And notice Christ's response. He doesn't begin to detail every little thing he could, but he gives this light analogy. Jesus says, the light is among you for a little while. Who is the light? Obviously, Jesus is the light. It's not here forever. He's not going to be here forever. He's just got a couple more days. He's saying, it's here. While you have the light, believe. And when you believe in the light, you become a true disciple. You become a son of light. See Jesus' earnest plea here? What he's doing is, he's saying, believe in the light. You can almost feel his emotion. It's, I'm not going to be with you much longer. Believe in me while you still have time. And what he's starting to help us see is there aren't four groups. There aren't four responses, if you will, to Jesus. There are just two. You have those who walk in darkness, and you have those who walk in light. And he's saying, while you got time, while I'm here, believe in the light so you may become a son of the light and not walk in darkness. But the sad reality is so much of the world, so many of us are just content to go on stumbling around as if we fought, forgot our smartphone flashlight in the other room in the darkness. First, the end of 36, the next paragraph. Here's the sad reality. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Although he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe. So that the word that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Jesus' response to this crowd is to hide himself. He's looking on and he's starting to, likely he's realizing they're not really interested in his primary purpose. Well, it doesn't seem like the Jesus thing to do to hide yourself from people, but that's precisely what happens. And that's exactly what Ricky read for us earlier. And that's the, the passage that John quotes is the exact passage that Ricky read, saying, when Jesus would come, they weren't going to listen. You see, they would not believe, and because they would not believe, they became unable to believe. So I think now it's prudent for us to consider ourselves within each of those various groups that we've seen so far as we start to turn the lens inward to our own hearts and minds. So the first group, the Pharisees that were opposed to Jesus, no matter what he said, I don't want to hear it. If we look back up, you could see that they said to each other, look, you are gaining nothing. They sought their own gain. They opposed him at all costs. And so it may be with some of us here in this room today, will it not? That we have absolutely no interest in King Jesus, in the Bible, in God. Or we may be openly opposed to him, often looking for intellectual ideas to prove this stuff wrong. 
Yes, for some, it might be rather amazing that you're sitting in here today, but, you know, just to keep the peace in the family around the holiday. My simple plea is that you would not allow yourself to stop believing so that you will become unable to believe as we sit here today. To not be like the Pharisees who are completely and totally blocked off so that anything related to the Lord, I'm just going to block it off. I'm just going to put up a barrier so it bounces off. If, if that's you, may I just plead with you not to allow that barrier here this morning. The second was the crowd that went to meet Jesus, the one that was chilling in the town and came out because they had heard of the sign that he had done. You know, sometimes we run to exciting things, don't we? And often our hearts are more concerned with chasing the exciting things than worshiping the king. Maybe it's a church that's busting at the seams, or maybe it's running to see something so you can be one of the first people to see it, so you can say, well, let me tell you what I saw, or to be one of the people in the know. Either way, who's the focus? It certainly isn't the king, is it? We're allowing our own glory to eclipse his. The third was the crowd that had actually seen Jesus bring Lazarus back to life. Big deal? Yeah. And they are actively bearing witness. Now they're part of the OGs of the triumphal entry. I was there when he did this. I saw it firsthand. I'm telling you, I did. I was there. Mm -hmm. And how many of us, I know I've fallen into this, have based our faith on what I've witnessed in my life, on what I've observed of how long I've been around the block. And verse 17 is jarring because it says they had seen him bring Lazarus back from the dead and they continued to bear witness about the sign, about what he had done. See, the text remains quiet, though, whether these are true disciples you see, faith is not even wrapped up in what I bear witness to. It's not even wrapped up in what I see with my own eyes. But there's so much more. See, and, and what Jesus has just done by hiding himself, he's proved to them that they don't need any more proof. The text said, he had done so many signs, and they still did not believe. They allowed their human minds, their human desires, their traditions to eclipse the glory and the light of the king. And some in that very same crowd even heard God the Father audibly speak. It, you know, it's just thunder. You know, sometimes we say, if God would just write it in the clouds, if you would just give me a sign, or you know what, if when I'm praying, he would just verbally tell me, then I would know. But what we're seeing here is that he had given everything they needed to know. There is no, I will believe in God when. See, he's given Every single one of us, all that we need to believe in him. He's given us all of the proof. He's given us his very word. He's given us his very son. He's given us his very spirit. And then the fourth group we saw were the disciples in verse 16. <coughs> Jesus calls his true followers sons of light later on. These are those who truly possess the light. He says, of these ones, whoever loves his life loses it. If he hates his life in this world, he will keep it for eternal life. You see the promise? 
If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. See, there are some who truly serve the eternal king by giving up their lives, and God the Father honors them. He gives them eternal life. Beautiful? Absolutely. But I found something really interesting in in verse 16 when it's talking about the disciples. It said, the disciples, you know, the guys who lived with Jesus and heard him say all of these things and heard him predict his own death, says his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they had remembered these things. You see, they didn't understand everything, but there came a point in their life after Jesus came back from the grave and like, oh, snap, he was talking about this. And things began to make more sense. So to you, Christian, if you don't understand what's going on in life, I pray this is an encouragement for you. If you don't understand what's happening with your family, what's happening at work, may you just hold to the truth that even the disciples themselves who were around Jesus, they didn't get everything, and they were living with him. And so my encouragement is just to continue to swim in his word and grow as time goes on and months turn into years that you too may potentially understand a little bit more about what he is doing. Let's look at verse 41. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And we see the fifth group. The authorities actually believed in King Jesus, but they didn't confess it, did they? Why? They were fearful of those Pharisees. They did not want to be put out of the synagogue. That, those were the external things. But there was something internal, wasn't there? They loved the glory of man more than the glory of God. Now, we don't know exactly what individuals they were. Could have been someone like Nicodemus or like a Joseph of Arimathea. But what we see is that even though they believed in Jesus, they allowed humans and human glory to eclipse the pure eternal glory, the pure light of Christ. See, this is the natural inclination of the human heart, isn't it? You know, to give more credence to the glory of man than to the glory of God. You know, a, a fun example How many of you have heard of the game Um, or the activity? It's called like the six degrees or the six connections to Kevin Bacon or whatever it is. Like you can get to any other human being on planet Earth by just six connections. So um, you think of someone like, well, I know so-and-so who knows so-and-so who knows so-and-so who knows. Pick your person. But we always try to like jockey for position, don't we? We're looking for man's glory. Oh, who I am, what I'm able to do. And while like knowing people can get you somewhere, especially if you're like uh, doing 50 and a 25, that's not what it's about, is it? It's, or it is about that, right? (laughs) The natural inclination is that I want you to think well of me and to give me honor. Some proofs that we are often more concerned with the glory of man. One, to tell the little white lie at work because no one's ever going to make notice the difference just to make myself look a little better. Talk a little extra in a meeting just to prove how smart you are. Students, to go riz someone up just because someone told you you should try so that you can just prove that you are good at getting attention to preach well, so folks will give you compliments, to build a bigger church, to do the work that God has given you 
to do, but for people. The reason I do my devotions or quiet times, people think well of me. I haven't even mentioned social media. You know, Paul tells us time and time again, whatever you do, work at it heartily as working for the Lord, not for men. See, Jesus just told the people that there is such thing as eternal life and eternal glory. And that last category of people even believed him. But, and I think that's the category, the group of people that hits closest to home for so many of us. Church, how many times in your life and in mine do I become more preoccupied with what people think of me, with the glory of man more than the glory of God? And the secret is, while it might open up doors, while it might get you more money, while it might get you a better job, while it might get you a spot on the team, while people might think better of you or listen when you speak, a hundred years from now for everyone in this building really 80 years, for some 20 years, others less, that glory that comes from man, it's gone. Man's glory is infinitely less than God's glory. And deep down we know that, don't we? Even if we don't ascribe to this whole Christian thing, the book of Ecclesiastes says that God has put eternity in the hearts of man. Deep down, we know that there's something else bigger and better and beyond us. Then why on earth do you and I not live like that? So you might be asking, what's God's glory? What's it look like? Well, today's text has given us a few indicators along the way. One, the word glory, glorify, shows up at least five times when it's referring to to the Father's glory or to Jesus' glory. Verse 28 says, Father, glorify your name, Jesus says to the Father. And the Father breaks through and says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. That's the whole thrust of this entire passage. See, Jesus in God's name has been glorified in times past. Isn't that why Jesus came? But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Thousands of years of history in the Bible points to the coming of Jesus. Verse 15 that we read today quotes Isaiah, I'm sorry, quotes Zechariah with Jesus riding in on a donkey. That was called hundreds of years before Jesus actually did it. John tells us that these things are happening. Why? So that the scripture might be fulfilled and thus glorify God's name. His name has been glorified in eternity past. And God's prophecy is being fulfilled in that very same moment, is it not, in Jesus Christ. But it doesn't just stop there. It says, and I will glorify it in the future. And at this very moment, we see Jesus, the God-man, both fulfilling prophecy and prophesying at the same time. He's doing what he said he would do as he's telling us what he's about to do. Secondly, this king's not dependent on man's glory or on human acceptance, is he? He even hid himself. It's not like he's doing all these signs so he can get a following so that they can all lock arms and fight the common enemy. 31 and 32, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. See, King Jesus is sufficient. The ruler of this world that he's referencing Satan is going, is not going to stand a chance, whether or not there's a million people following King Jesus or two people following King Jesus. He is still king. He says he will draw all people to himself. Now, this is fascinating because he's not necessarily talking about all human beings, but what group of people was he talking to in that portion of the passage? It's not to the Jews but it's to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, to those who traditionally didn't belong there. Jesus is saying is, there will be a time when all peoples and nations and languages and tribes and tongues will glorify Jesus Christ as the king. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. But he's not just the king of Israel. He is the king of everything. So we often go to Revelation 7, do we not? The fulfillment of Jesus saying, I will draw all people to myself comes when John in the book of Revelation writes, after this, I looked and behold, there's a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and people and language and tribe and tongue standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's the fulfillment of what Jesus just prophesied. And he prophesies his very own death as he will be humiliated, as he's lifted up for all to see on the cross. Paul addresses that, doesn't he, in Philippians 2? Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus didn't care about man's glory. He was humiliated. And because of that, Paul goes on in Philippians 2, because Jesus humiliated himself and didn't care about man's glory, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lift it up. I want you to see this connection of the word lifted up it means both humiliation and exaltation. And that's precisely the language that we saw in John 12, was it not? So that these things happen so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Now catch this, just if you still have your Bibles open, look down at verse 41 of John 12. We glossed over this earlier. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Why did Isaiah say these things? He saw God's glory. And who did Isaiah see? Well, I would wager that Isaiah saw Jesus, that Isaiah saw a pre-incarnate, Jesus Christ, in the throne room that Ricky read for us earlier. And when, you may ask, did Isaiah see God? Well, that great throne room, verse 1 through 7 of Isaiah chapter 6, describes the throne room. Verse 8 and on describes what happens in the throne room. What John quotes in John chapter 12 is from the throne room. And so when Isaiah talks about being lifted up, I think he has Christ in view. And in that moment, as Isaiah saw Christ seated on the throne, you better believe that Isaiah didn't care one rip about what any human being thought. In the year, Isaiah 6, just listen to these words. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Just like in John chapter 12. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth. Friends, he will be lifted. He will be lifted up because his glory is far too wonderful. And the train of his robe filled the temple, Isaiah 6. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. What's he talking about? Angels. And they're calling one to another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You see, whenever you see his glory, there's no way you can eclipse it when it's all over the world. We might think we can, we might even try, but it's hopeless. Verse 4, 
The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. <clears throat> and Isaiah said, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You see, he recognized he was nothing compared to the Lord, and that the people he lived among were also nothing. And notice his last line, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Who did Isaiah see? The king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. My eyes have seen the king also interesting worth saying that John who wrote that Isaiah saw the Lord is the very same one who describes Jesus in the book of Revelation. And here, after he sees Christ, you know what he says? I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I'm the first and the last, and the living one. I die, and behold, I am alive evermore. I certainly would have fallen dead at his feet. Isaiah saw the beforehand. John saw later, after Jesus came back from the dead. And this king of glory, as it did for John, as it did for Isaiah, ought to eclipse everything. And so as we wrap up, two very quick comments of application. One, true believer in Jesus, you can trust the king. No matter how shaky your life is, your circumstance, your family, your finances, your whatever it may be, if he's the king of all glory, can you not trust him? As he told John, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Fear not, Christian. Secondly, you might be asking, how do I stop caring about the glory of man? Well, that's a fair question. <laughs> the answer is simple, and it's also kind of complex. You look to Jesus and behold him in his glory. The way you care less about man's glory is you care more about the glory of God. In which you might ask the appropriate next question. How? You read his word. And one way to do that, this Palm Sunday, as we consider kingship, is to open up to Isaiah chapter 6. So in a moment... As we close, I'm just going to ask you to stand. And then, if you're able, after you stand, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 6 of that throne room encounter. And as I read, I want you to envision yourself. Imagine that you're in that very same room that Isaiah is describing. Picturing the glory of the majesty of the king seeing what he sees, smelling what he smells, hearing what he hears, feeling what he feels. Make sense what we're about to do? Okay, so would you, would you stand with me? And if you're able, if you just close your eyes and imagine the glory of the king. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. Holy, holy.
holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts.